friends. Welcome to another week of Her Story, His Story, Our Story. This week we're going to do things a little differently. For one thing, Kristen and Kelsey are not greeting you, but I'm greeting you, Adele. And today we're going to interview someone that some of you may know well, and she's going to tell us a story of something that happened in her life a few years ago that really changed the trajectory of who she thought she is and how she navigates life. Then we're gonna follow with that for his story, a very, very short, um, I guess it's mostly a, just a little reflection on some verses from 130, Psalm 139, and after that, a very short hour story. I hope you'll stay tuned for the whole thing and then at the end, I'm hoping that you will be able to implement the Our Story, which will be a little different as well. So hang in with us and enjoy, and God bless you. Hi, friends. Adele O's here. Today, I want to introduce you to Courtney Flagg. Courtney and her husband, Greg, daughters, Aurora and Hannah, can be seen around church a lot. Most of you will probably know them. You'll know Courtney because she's always bustling around and she's often behind the co coffee bar. But Courtney and Greg suffered a um, pretty devastating experience just a few years ago and have had to walk through a pretty dark tunnel. And so I've asked Courtney if she would come and share that with you today. So Courtney, would you tell us your story? Thank you, Adele. Yeah, thanks for the, the opportunity. Um, so like Adele said, um, married to Greg, we just celebrated 12 years. And um, I kind of realized that we were ready to have kids about five years into our marriage. And um, had Aurora um, right when I actually on my 31st birthday <laughs> um, and then we knew that we wanted to have a couple kids so when Aurora was two um, we had decided to try again um, and got pregnant again and it was very very excited um, and I have an experience where I get extreme morning sickness um, called hyperemesis gravidarum, but it's, it's crippling morning sickness. So I got to the point where I was getting sick multiple times a day. I wasn't able to work. I couldn't get out of bed physically just because I had no energy and I had to get IV infusions. So I, I was having a pretty tough time. I lost about 30 pounds in six weeks. So it was a pretty intense pregnancy. Um, but the thing that they kept telling me throughout the pregnancy was, um, you know, this is just, you've got a really strong pregnancy. Like it, it's a good sign. It means that, you know, your risk of miscarriage is, is slim to none. And, um, you know, the baby is okay. You know, you don't feel that good. <laughs> We'd love for you to gain some weight, but you know, ultimately the baby's good. Um, and so we were at an, I was at an 18 week appointment. Um, and I just remember the doctor said that, you know, the heartbeat is strong. Everything is good. And I, I distinctly remember saying, well, of course, or see, thinking, of course, the heartbeat's good. Why wouldn't it be? Um, just, it's funny now because it just feels so naive. <laughs> um, and I went to my 20 week ultrasound to find out the sex of the baby. Um, I went by myself because we were having a gender reveal party two days later. And so I was not going to actually find out the sex of the baby. It was going to be a surprise. They were going to slip it into an envelope. Um, so I went by myself. And it started off very typical and normal and admiring the, the pictures of the baby and the spine. And I was telling the technician about the party we were gonna have. And, and I just, I felt uh, the screen came up where you see the baby and then um, the, the heartbeat um, on the bottom. And it was, a, it was a flat line. And I remember seeing that and it, it not registering in that moment, what that was. I'm like, huh, that's weird. I wonder if that's something else. Um, and I just, it, it didn't click in that moment. And then I just felt a complete change in the technician. And I started looking at her more and she wasn't really chatting with me anymore. She was staring intently at the screen. 
and I just, I knew something was wrong. And then I asked, can I hear the baby's heartbeat? And she just started crying. Um, and then I realized that that, that my baby was gone. Um, and it, it was just so surreal. Cause I remember rocking back and forth on the table, repeating to myself, like, it's going to be okay. Everything happens for a reason. Everything. I went into this, just this repetition cycle of repeating this to me, rocking, trying to, in, a, in my head though, I'm like, what is going on? Um, so I, you know, the technician had to go get a doctor and, and check it out. And then um, she was very concerned about me because I was by myself and I just, I wanted to get home. And so I had to call Greg and tell him at work. Um, and then I, I drove home very, 10 and two very tightly and um, waited for him to come home. And then I just, when he came home, I fell on the ground and was just completely in pieces about the fact that we lost our baby. Um, and so we had to go meet our doctor and confirm it and make some really hard decisions. And um, because I was 20 weeks, I had a choice of a DNC or to deliver. Um, I wanted to meet our child, because I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl, I wanted to name them, I wanted to make them part of our family. So we chose to deliver um, because of circumstances outside of our control. Um, it took almost a week to get into the hospital to be able to deliver. We kept being delayed every day for four, three days. And so that was really hard because I, it was making it hard to move on to the next step. Um, and I was basically carrying around a child that was no longer alive. And so that just really messes with your head. And um, I spent a lot of time during that time not sleeping and um, up at night trying to understand and grasp what this meant and why God would allow this to happen. And what did this mean? Was he protecting the baby? Was he protecting me? what reason could this be? I was dealing with anger. I was dealing with complete and utter disbelief. Um, I've never felt so raw and so vulnerable because <laughs> one moment you're pregnant and the next moment you're not. And, you know, people comment like walking around so proud that you're pregnant and feeling glowing to like, please don't look at me and draw any attention to this belly that I still had. And um, it was really hard. Um, and just trying to process with Greg and like, just feeling so uncomfortable, feeling so angry um, about this situation and what this meant. And um, it, it was, it just made for some very interesting feelings and emotions and discussions. Um, and we finally got the chance to get into the hospital. Um, a nurse, they were going to turn me away again. And a, a shift coordinator basically brought me in and said, she'll take care of me, which is not typical. And um, she, they started to induce me. Um, and it took about 24 hours um, for my body to get to that space. And all the while we're meeting with social workers and I'm in the hospital calling funeral homes trying to figure out cremation, burial, what's the cost, what can we afford, what does this mean, and um, just decisions never in a million years I thought I would have to make, um, and so we, she came um, uh, December 10th at about 11 o'clock at night. Um, I started feeling the labor and started feeling like, okay, I gotta, I gotta do this, and I um, decided all of a sudden that I didn't want to feel this. I was, it was painful enough in my soul and in my heart that I didn't want to also physically feel this pain. So I asked, I got an epidural and not long after I got that, um, she came out, um, came out in the sack and they started to take her away. And I said, no, wait, I want to, I want to know what she is. I didn't know it was a girl at the time. I want to know what it is. And they took her out and they handed her to me and they said she was beautiful and 10 fingers 10 toes she looked beautiful and that just um that crushed me even more than that I was like well why what, what happened why because the, the cord wasn't around I mean there there ultimately was no we never got an explanation of why we lost her um but I was able to hold her and name her and um just to get to be with her 
um, which was really important to me. And we got pictures. Um, and, you know, in the moment, you don't think, why would you want pictures? But I cherish them so much. Mm -hmm. And handprints and footprints. And um, they took her away. And then they brought her back for one last goodbye. And then, um, and then I left labor and delivery without my baby. So, and, and when you had to leave your baby there, when you had to leave, um, what, what did it, what did it feel like in your soul? And what did it feel like in your relationship with, with God? Um, I was still just grappling with trying to understand it. And um, I felt an emptiness and a hole in my heart that was where my baby was supposed to be. And I just, I really didn't know what to do with this raw, vulnerable state. I had never experienced such a deep sense of pain. Um, and I, I, I went to, I ended up, <laughs> I listened to a song on repeat <laughs> for a while um, and it's Oceans. By, by by Hillsong, and um, it it just talks about um, your trust being without borders, mm -hmm. and God walking you. I, I wrote it down and just would just listen to it on repeat because the verses talk about just God walking you to where you know your feet would never wander, and um, you know this was a path I never would have chosen for myself, and. Um, that ultimately your, your trust is without borders. So I was trying to grasp the, the trust piece of like, I, I do trust in God. I know who God is. I, I know he can handle my anger, right? I know he can handle all of this and, and I do still trust who he is, but I still didn't understand. Um, and so I, but I, I prayed for that hope um, that there could be a purpose. I prayed for, um, just a deep sense of healing um and if it is this even possible for me to because there were times where I'm like how do you even survive something like that like losing a child and um and it was just interesting too because you know she wasn't like you know a grown child she wasn't five years old I had her you know she was in my womb I I didn't know her but I did know her um and so that was a weird concept to feel like um but we wanted to we still feel like God created her in my womb and she was knitted and made perfectly. And God decided to take her home earlier than I would have liked, but, um, he still created her. So to me, that still meant she, her life had purpose. Um, and it was my job to figure out what that purpose was because my role as her mother wasn't the typical role. You know, my role wasn't to change her diaper and, and, feed her and teach her how to walk and all that but my role was you know how do I use her life you know to serve others or to help others or just to to honor to honor her and honor God and who God created her um and just try to understand that well and I know that somehow over time you and Greg have found a way um through that, through that darkness, the darkness of that tunnel, um, that you did find a way, and you did find a way that God redeemed some of that or gave back to you some of that light into your life after that incredible darkness. And do you want to tell us about that? Because I think it's it's a testimony of of how God has given you um, a different a a different door to walk through, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, as part of our, our our healing and walking through our grief journey, we found um, a support group called Sharing Parents. And it's a support group for families, grief parents of infant loss, um, stillbirth and miscarriage. And so we, we went to those meetings on a pretty regular basis and went through an intense grief um, supports um thing and it allowed us to walk through a grief and face our grief and understand it a little better to where all of a sudden I didn't have to wonder if I was going to get through the day that learning how to walk with this as part of our story um 
and then not to totally, you know, pre make it so we couldn't operate. Um, and after a year of being a part of that group, I wanted to do something to honor Zoe. And so I became a facilitator within that support group and started helping facilitate the, the sessions that I went to um, and, you know, guide other people through that process as well. Um, I've had opportunities to um, be a part of a hotline when, you know, parents or moms call just trying to get answers and questions. And then we have an annual, um, annual memorial service that happens at the Rose Garden at the Capitol. And so I've shared my story there to those families. Um, and I've, I've emceed the, the, the memorial service as well. So I've had those opportunities at, on different avenues. And then also just on personal levels, um, I had a girlfriend who felt connected by Zoe's story and made me a painting, a beautiful painting. And then sadly, a couple years later, she had her own loss um, at 16 weeks. And so then she called me and then I was able to walk her through some of that and just to listen. And I've, I've had a number of friends call me um, including a mom friend who we met on a on our anniversary trip and then a couple months later she lost her triplets and so walking her through that and talking with her and just trying to be a voice and a and a and a person to be able to walk with them is it's been amazing we've also been resources for family members or friends you're like hey I just had a friend lost someone what do I say to them because it's so hard to know how to interact or what to say and so Greg and I have both been asked about that. And so it's, it's been amazing to see how this experience has given us a level of empathy that um, we would have never had otherwise to help others walk through it. Um, I, for all of our sakes, it, it's, we always talk about it's a club we never wish we belonged to, but um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's real and it's, it happens. And so we've been able to, it's, it's, it's helped me a lot. It's somewhat selfish sometimes because it just, it gives Zoe's life purpose. And um, that's really important to me. And I feel like it's also my way of continuing to trust God because there's still parts of it that I don't understand and I don't know if I ever will. Um, but I also trust that God is continuing to use her life mm -hmm. in, in, in the, in this way. So, and so, and so I know that, that, that has really enriched and deepened this whole experience for you. Was there anything that God did as you were walking through it or any, any, any scriptures that he brought to you to bring you hope or comfort or remind you that he was in it with you um yeah there there's a verse that um was familiar to me but i hadn't really gone to it in a while and it came up in my mind and it's in lamentations um 321 and it just it talks about um you know yet i call this to mind and therefore i have hope that you know we are not consumed and um you know, his compassions never fail and they're new every morning and great is your faithfulness. So th that verse was, was, um, particular, it particular to me in different phases of my grief journey. Cause in the beginning I felt consumed by either anger or just complete disbelief or a lack of trust or just, I felt consumed. And so knowing that his compassions were new every morning, um, was comforting to me and then come and then eventually being able to recognize the peace for therefore I have hope um, and that was something I went back to a lot and it it's almost it just as a reminder was a reminder to me that every day I had to trust that God was with me and that he had enough compassions for to carry me through that you know, when you were reading, or when you were reciting that verse, I got goosebumps. Um, it, because because it's amazing. You you were you were consumed for a while, but not consumed. And it and right, it felt like it. <laughs> yeah, I. But I I wasn't. There was no, always because you're here, and you're yeah, and you're a testimony to to how God brings you through. A really challenging time and he gave me a husband who was so gracious and so gentle and a daughter that helped me 
forced me to get out of bed for her thing mm -hmm. yeah. and friends that brought meals and friends that delivered soft pitch cozy pants to my doorstep with licorice and a sister who flew that same day she heard about it and flew over to be with me so I we we definitely were shown through Zoe how much we we are loved and um that was really special for both Greg and I and then just the fact that it bonded Greg and I together um on a whole deeper level was was pretty pretty intense because for a lot of couples it can drive them apart exactly I was going to say the very same thing I know that that sometimes it does drive people apart so Courtney, you are such a um, you are such a life giving person, and it's just so so neat and so sweet that you would share this story. and And I just want to thank you because it's been a blessing to hear it. And I know that all of us who know you will appreciate the depth of um, how God has walked you through deep waters. So thank you. Thank you, Adele. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. giving me a space to share her story. Thank you so much for allowing us into your life, Courtney, for sharing with such transparency a time that was really a watermark, a really hard time for you and Greg. And thank you, too for giving us an insight into what it was like to lose a child that you were looking forward to. One of the things that Courtney's story reminded me of is that darkness is a part of our lives. You know, if you hear a story that starts once upon a time, what kind of story do you think you're getting? But what if you hear a story that starts, it was a dark and stormy night? You're looking for a different kind of story, and that's what you're going to get, a different kind of story. And when the psalmist in Psalm 139 kind of switches gears and talks about God's sovereignty and God's action in life, the psalmist says, If I say, surely... The darkness will overwhelm me, and the light will be as night. That psalmist answers and says to himself, Darkness is not dark to thee. Night is as light as day. Darkness and light are alike to you. You know, when we think about darkness and about God in darkness, I'm always reminded of some of the parables of Jesus. Of course, in John, he talks about, in, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it cannot produce fruit. But I was thinking of the mustard seed. You know, in Matthew 13, 31, Jesus talks about the mustard seed, that it falls and it becomes um, it, it becomes a great tree, and in that tree, the birds of the air find their nests. But if I think about any seed, you and I know that a seed has to fall into the ground, and it has to die. It literally, it splits for the life to come out of it and for that tree to grow out of it. And so when I think about that, I think about where does that happen? Where does that split happen? Where does that growth begin? It begins in the darkness. It begins in the ground. Fertility and growth begin in the dark. So Psalm 139, when that psalmist says, Darkness and light are alike to, de to thee or to you. What that psalmist is telling us is that God is in that darkness. That God is there as that seed is splitting and dying so that that tree can grow. And if I extend that to Courtney's story, out of that darkness and that pain and grief that she's 
experiences still, God is in it. And that out of the growth, Courtney and Greg are able to become the tree where others can come with their pain and with that same kind of story and be healed. That is God in darkness. So what do I think our story is? And how can this relate to you or to me? So let me give you a couple of ideas for practice in the darkness, because I practice this at night sometimes. One is, in the darkness, pray this way. Very slowly, as you go to bed before you go to sleep, breathe in very slowly. And then retain your breath, and in that breath, say, Lord, I'm here. And then fill in the blank, me. Meet me. Speak to me. Tell me you love me. You fill in that blank while you retain your breath. And then slowly let your breath out fully. Repeat that in the darkness three or four times. Another option that I would offer to you for our story is to breathe in slowly. And as you breathe in, breathe, come Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit comes as breath. Then as you breathe out, breathe out, take my burden or bring me peace. Breathe out fully and then do it again three or four or five times. But do that in the darkness before you go to sleep and let the Spirit of God in the darkness meet you. I hope that you will have a wonderful week that even as we are still struggling with a lot of stress and a lot of loss, that you will find peace and presence in the darkness. God bless you and stay tuned for next week. <laughs>